Hi. What happened there? No, I don't know. I'm lost for a minute. <laughs> okay. Let's uh, let's get into it if we can. Okay. Um, as I say, just going through through your bag and uh, just going through a couple of things uh, over the net actually, and uh, looking at how you guys actually got started. Um, as I say, for for the people out there who who don't know your humble beginnings. Uh, and, and how this and how the band actually got together? Could you sort of uh, give us a bit of history on on how you Quick got synopsis of the whole thing? Yeah. Um, well, Chris and I met in college when we were about eighteen, and um, we played together sort of on and off ever since then. Um, you know, we had a series of bands in school, and then when we got out of school, we had we had a few. We had well, basically, it was the same band. We just kept changing the name. Okay. <laughs> But um, we, we, we played together for a long time. Um, we actually made a record about five years ago um, that was never released. We, we signed to a little startup record company in New York that went out of business, oh, and uh, the, rec the record disappeared. Okay. And uh, that wasn't under the name Fountains of Wayne. Mm. It was actually under the name, well, at the time we were called the Wallflowers. Mm, interesting. And then, and, yeah, and then we... <laughs> We actually sold that name to the Wallflowers ah. because they had it at the same time we did, and we decided we didn't care enough about a band name to keep it, so we'd just take the money. Right. So, so we then changed our name to Pinwheel, and we were called Pinwheel for a while. Then this, this whole thing with this record company, this little record company happened, and it sort of screwed us up for a while. We, we had a couple of years of legal limbo where we couldn't do anything. Mm. So me, meanwhile, we sort of went our separate ways for a couple of years. Chris was living in Boston and I was living in New York. And um, I ended up playing with a different band and so did he. Okay. And then uh, he moved down to New York a couple of years later. And uh, as soon as he moved back to town, we started hanging out again and, and playing music again. Right. And uh, I guess about a year after he moved to town, he called me up one day and said uh, that he'd just written some new stuff that he wanted me to hear. And, he brought over Radiation Vibe and Weave the Biker and Joe Ray, mm -hmm. which he had written all in one afternoon, and I thought they were all really great and sort of different from the stuff we'd been doing before. Right. And uh, so I got really inspired and went home and started writing, and we both just cranked out a lot of songs in about a week. Mm -hmm. We wrote the whole album in about a week, and it was just a very inspired period. Right. Did you actually have a deal at that point to release the album? Uh, no, we didn't. We, we had... Um, we, we, we wrote we wrote about 20 songs, and, and then we went into this recording studio just to put them on tape as soon as we could because we, we just were excited about them. And mm. this was around Christmas time of 95, I guess. Mm. Um, sort of a slow period in New York. Most of our friends were away. We just, you know, there was no pressure on us that we were making a record. We were just doing it to do it, which mm. I think is part of the reason that it came out sounding the way it did because it was just a really relaxed time and there was no sense of tension or pressure or money being mm -hmm. spent or anything. Mm -hmm. um, so we did about half the record in a weekend and then, then we shopped that around to people. Okay. Not, you know, not even realizing it was necessarily the record. It was sort of was more of a demo tape. Yeah. Um, and then after we worked out a, a deal, we, we went back and did the rest of it a few months later, but we tried to maintain the same spirit that we had done the first session in. Right. You know, which is just doing it as quickly and as carelessly and as sloppily as we could. <laughs> yeah, because that seems to be a, a constant theme with, with, with everything that you do is the sort of uh, very much, well, sort of a tongue-in-cheek kind of uh, um, sort of pop, if you have to call it that. Yeah. Is, is that sort of like, like an intended route for you that you are, are sort of uh, on a mission to enjoy this as much as possible and not sort of be roped into all the, you know, the the hype that that goes with uh, with a well with a new with a with a debut album like this. Well, I, you know, I think our attitude has always been that we take songwriting very seriously, actually, and we we're both really kind of. generations before us mm. so in that sense we do take it seriously but we don't take the whole trappings of being in a rock band very seriously mm. and you know to us the whole central kind of joke of this record was the idea that we were taking these 
songs that we had written on our acoustic guitar, which is the way we had always written, and just going into the studio and banging them out with a Marshall amp <laughs> and sort of fooling people into thinking that we were a rock band. <laughs> mm, 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 mm. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. When, when in truth, I mean, that's just not where we come from at all. I mean, we don't, we don't have any kind of punk rock roots or, you know, hard rock roots. And, you know, we don't really believe in the, all the myths that go along with being a, a rock band. Mm. Um, you know, Chris in particular is much happier to just sit at home and play his acoustic guitar. And I mean, if he could, if he could make a living by just writing and never leaving his apartment, he'd probably do that instead. <laughs> okay, because you are, you are sort of primarily a two-piece, though. You have now got another two members. Are those now full-time members in the band? Not really. It's a very loose thing. I mean... Everybody in the band is involved in different things. And I mean, that's another another thing that we really feel is, you know, different about our band. I mean, we don't we don't have this gang mentality that everybody has to be committed to this single, you know, yeah. this, this one thing and, and, you know, put everything else aside. And, you know, Jody, our guitar player, has his own band. Brian plays in, in the posies mm -hmm. whenever they feel like doing something, <laughs> yeah. which, is, which is not so often these days, but, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. um, you know, Chris and I both do things outside the band. Mm, mm. And I, I mean, we, we sort of have intentionally left it really loose with everybody because our attitude is that, you know, we hope we can stay together and it's turned out to be a really good four-piece band. Mm. But if somebody doesn't feel like it, you know, then that's that's up to them. Mm. Did, did, did you actually expect uh, the album and, uh, and obviously now the, well, the band as a whole, I mean, Fountains of Wayne, to actually do as well as it has to this point? Um... It's really hard to say. I mean, you know, and I don't think that we expected to get the kind of critical attention that we've gotten in some places. I mean, we were, there's, you know, there's a fear that you have when you do something so quickly that, that people, you know, it's not legitimate somehow or something. Mm. And so I, we were scared that, like, you know, most of the press would, would be, you know, oh, who are these two wise asses from New York, you know? And, yeah. I mean, why are they why are they setting all their private jokes to music <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah but self-indulgent perhaps yeah mm. I'm, I'm here I'm here oh, don't worry I'm here I'm here much better than I expected hello hi there hi you still hear me yeah I can still hear you I don't know what's happening okay. yeah um you know but you know in terms of, of like selling records, I mean, we really didn't know what to expect. I mean, when we, when, we, when we brought the tape to record companies in the first place, I mean, everybody seemed to want to put it out. So, you know, we, we hoped that it would, that it would do well. Mm. And, um, you know, in some places it has, and in some places it hasn't. Mm, mm, mm. But it's done well enough for at least to get, to, you know, for us to go to all these places and, and see places we haven't seen and mm, so mm. forth. Yeah, because as I say, with, uh, with you, as you say, sort of keeping it quite loose, I mean, you... You, you had a band prior to this, and you, you still have a band called Ivy. Um, right. What, is it sort of a completely different uh, kind of uh, music that you're putting out there compared to, say, Fountains of Wayne? It's very different, but it is still based on pop songwriting. Mm. Um, but, the, you know, nobody would ever confuse the two bands. I mean, th there's actually a new Ivy record coming out in America in October mm -hmm. of this year. And uh, I don't know if or when it will be released in South Africa, but I hope it will mm. be sometime next year. Right. Uh, but, you know, the obvious difference between the two bands is the, is the lead singers. I mean, sure. the lead singer of Ivy is a, is a French woman. Uh-huh. Hello. Sort of. Yeah, no. yeah, I mean, there's some stuff. There's It's, it's mellower, definitely, and... and and there's there's sort of more texture and atmosphere on the record. It's you know, mm. so, I don't know. I, I somebody asked me to compare the two bands once, and I, you know, the only thing I could think of is that uh, Fountains of Wayne is a band that you'd probably get get drunk and listen to, and and, and Ivy's a band that you probably smoke pot and listen to. <laughs> okay, fair enough. <laughs> and uh, as I say, I mean, obviously, you, when you released the album, you know, there were uh, sort of comparisons floating around to to the style of music that you were doing and, and things like Weezer and um, Presidents of the U, uh, of the United States came up and things like that. How, um, you've sort of given me an analogy now of, 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 of the band sound, but how would you sort of sum it up best? Our sound? Yes. Or 
compared to those bands you're talking about? Or? Yeah, because I mean, it was interesting to me that they made those comparisons, you know, to, to the likes of Weezer and things like that. Well, I mean, that's sort of what I was saying before, you know. I mean, we intentionally made the record sound like a modern and sort of current record. And I mean, that was that was intentional, you know. Mm. But I think that, you know, the, the, the main difference between us and these bands, I think, is, is the way we write songs and the kinds of songs we're writing. Mm. I mean, you know, we, if somebody asked us to take the same batch of songs and produce it to sound like, um, you know, I don't know, Lisa Stansfield or mm. something, I mean, we could do that too, mm. you know. And, and so we, there's always been this kind of distance for us be, between the songs themselves and the way they're put on tape. Mm. I mean, it was, it was sort of a conscious choice to, to record them the way we recorded them. Mm. Mm. Um, so, you know, I, I think the similarities to those bands are, are sort of, um, they're obvious on the surface like that, but, yeah. you know. Mm -hmm. Because, I mean, also, I mean, you and Chris have been working, I mean, on and off together, you know, for, for, for quite a period. Why was it um, that you did the album now and, and perhaps not sooner? Was it just that the songs were right now? And I think that was the main thing. I think that we sort of had a big breakthrough in, in our writing and, and in, in, in our attitude as well. I think when we were younger, you know, we took the whole thing a lot more seriously and we also tried too hard to write, quote, you know, classic songs all the time. And a lot of times they just sounded really kind of adolescent and, you know, sort of forced. Mm -hmm. and, and so now, as we get older, we can just, like, embrace our complete adolescence and <laughs> make them stupider and looser and they actually come out better that way. Right, right. So so there will be, there will be a Fountains of Way in part two and part three. Is that sort of the goal? Uh, yeah, definitely. I mean, we're, you know, we're, we're sort of writing new stuff now and talking about when, when we might go in and do some, some more recording. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, hopefully we, we can do it out of uh, the view of the record company this time so that we can maintain the same kind of spirit. Mm -hmm. And looking at your songs, they, they are obviously sort of, um, extensions of your personalities of, of where they are, you know, of where you are now. Would, would you, would you sort of agree with that? Well, I think they're they're a reflection of where we were for that week that, that we wrote them. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's, it's just funny how when you write a batch of songs in a short period of time, they all sort of refer to the same things. And, mm. you know, there's a similarity that runs between them all. And, you know, people had pointed out, like, oh, there's all this stuff about New York on here, or there's all this stuff about cars, or, whatever. you know, you just kind of throw in the same things to all the songs because mm. your mind is just in a certain place. And, I, I you know, we, we've sort of, we sort of just thought that for our next record, we'll just write about whatever we feel like writing about now and not mm. worry too much about making it sound at all like that record. Because, mm -hmm. and then uh, obviously the, the, the people who buy the albums and, and the fans that you um, are playing this, uh, playing your songs to, do, do do they sort of understand uh, what it is that you, you're trying for, you know, what, uh, what the songs are actually about and so on? I think some people do. I mean, you know, we, we, we'd like it We'd like it for people to be able to enjoy the song on the simplest level, and even if they don't give a shit about us or what we're trying to do, mm. you know, and that's why we try to make the songs catchy. I mean, it's, you know, if you're 13 years old and you like a song that you hear on the radio, it's not because you, you know, you empathize with the songwriter, it's just because you, you like it, you mm. know, and you don't even know what it's about or anything. Mm. Um, but, you know, I think we've also gotten a certain number of fans that are kind of older and a little bit more musically literate and sort of pick up certain references here and there that other people might not mm -hmm. you know which, which I mean, is what you would it. want yeah yeah I mean it's, it's nice you know mm -hmm. and uh, influences for you sort of uh, people who who sort of have inspired you to do the kinds of things that you've done has it been on your own or have you sort of taken from the likes of other musicians who have maybe tried a similar thing and not succeeded or maybe have um, well, I mean, musical influences, I, I imagine, are probably pretty obvious. I mean, we both we both were influenced by a lot of, you know, the Beatles and Beach Boys and mm. Zombies and a lot of 60s pop and also a lot of 80s British music that was sort of what was going on while we were in college when we first started playing together. Mm. Um, you know, a lot of stuff like The Smiths and Billy Bragg and early Aztec Camera Records and mm. Everything But The Girl and Orange juice. Yeah, a, a lot of UK um, 
Yeah, we, we listen to a lot more UK music probably than American music on, as a whole. But, you know, there's also this sort of element of just taking all the cliches from the AM radio that we grew up on, too. Mm. You know? Mm, mm. I mean, just, you know, any American kid knows Cheap Trick or Blue Oyster Cult or Peter Frampton or any of this stuff because mm. you couldn't avoid it, mm, mm, you know, mm. at a certain time. Mm. And, when, and when you look at actually putting the songs together, what... What is the art of actually putting a, a perfect pop song together like like you have on the album? Um, well, I think the most important thing for us is that the best songs really are the ones that are written the fastest. And everything on this record was written, you know, really quickly. There, mm. there, there were no songs from our old band that were lying around. There were no songs that we had to, like, sit on for two months in order to finish. I mean, usually... If a song is good, that the whole thing sort of comes to you at once, you know, it's just like suddenly you have an idea for a title or you have an idea for a little melody and, and you know, it's already kind of instantly worked out in your head before you've even actually finished it. Mm. You know, you sort of just get a sense of where it's going and then it's done and you just don't even realize it. And it's the song that you kind of keep coming back to but don't quite finish it. You know, mm. it's better to just throw those in the garbage. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, I mean, we, we try not to be precious about it. You know, we try to say, We'll write something, we'll finish it. If it's not good, we'll write something else. Mm. You know, we're not one of these bands that says, oh, well, we have this song, and we like the verse, but we don't like the chorus, so if we could just fix that, you know, mm. once you start getting into fixing a song, it's already too late. Mm. Mm. It's like a piece of art, really, isn't it? Yeah. <clears throat> I, I, I suppose. I mean, you know, it's just, it, it really is, it's, it's hard because, you, you know, you have infinite choices, even within a three-minute song, where you're going to go with it, you know, sure. how many times you're going to rewrite a line or... But at a certain point, you just have to you have to just do it quickly and say you're satisfied with it and, and move on away. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then you your link with uh, with Scratchy Records. Um, why was why did you actually do that? What what, what was the uh, thinking behind doing that and and the actual focus with the label? Well, it was sort of started um, in a very haphazard way because I had talked about wanting to start some kind of indie label with, with a couple of my friends. And uh, my, one, one of them was a, a guy named Jeremy Freeman, who's I, one of my oldest friends in the world, and I've known him my whole life. Mm -hmm. And um, by, by chance, he ended up marrying Darcy's sister. Mm -hmm. um, so he's now Dar Darcy from the Smashing Pumpkins, yes. and, you know, yes. his, his sister-in-law. So we, we became friends with James and Darcy from the Pumpkins through that connection. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we had all known each other for a while, and then it was actually Jeremy's idea. Darcy and James had been talking about starting some kind of label, too, and it was actually Jeremy's idea that we all kind of do it together and we get a larger group of people. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and the focus with the label? The focus? Yeah, musically. Um, well, our, our idea was that rather... You know, we were talking about what kind of music we would do, and we all had different ideas about what we should do, and then I think it was Jeremy who actually proposed the idea that, you know it makes more sense right now to do an indie label that doesn't have such a narrow focus because people's record collections in 1997 don't reflect that, you know? Mm, I mean, people, people don't just go out and buy one kind of music. And, and because of the fact that we had the Smashing Pumpkins involved, too, I mean, we thought that we could take a chance and build a label that was, you know, much more diverse than your typical startup indie label mm. and, uh, you know, put out a dancehall reggae album and then put out a punk rock album and then put out, you know, um, you know, a spoken word record. I mean, whatever we felt like and that people would, you know, would hopefully sort of just gravitate toward the label in general and try things out that they weren't used to listening to. Mm, mm, mm. Sort of like a, a, a 4AD type thing if you think about it. Well, I think even 4AD in a way was, was more focused than we are mm. because, you know, I mean, certainly their bands didn't all sound exactly the same but there was a certain Mm. you know, alternative bent to the whole thing. Yeah, theme, yeah. You know, and I mean, and I, I don't think that anybody could even make any comparison between any of our bands. <laughs> I mean, our bands are just so wild, you know, all of our acts are just so wildly different from each other. I mean, there, there's there's no way to, to, to give our label any kind of a description of a sound. Mm -hmm. And and if, if you sort of had to separate yourself from, from all the sort of... Uh, all the bands and everything else that you're involved in, I mean, right down to the point of doing uh, stuff for, for movies, like uh, the things you do. What what kind of what kind of music would, would you ideally like to, to, to make? Uh, 
my favorite music in the world is Brazilian pop music, but I don't have any idea how to make it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, fair enough. <laughs> Okay, and on on that note, um, Adam, can I ask you to do an ID for me? Sure. Um, okay, I, I do a show on College Radio here. Um, uh -huh. Very, very cliched name for a show. It's called The Cutting Edge. Okay. Um, you can play with that if you like, and obviously just throw fountains of Wayne in there. That would be great. Uh, and what's the station called? Or you just say you're listening to The Cutting Edge? Yeah, you just, yeah you're listening to The Cutting Edge, yeah. Okay. Uh, I, I, I'm afraid that I'm I'm too tired right now to be very witty, so I'm just going to give you a straight one. <laughs> All right, whenever you're ready. Whenever you're ready. <laughs> okay. Hi, this is that guy, Adam Schlesinger from Fountains of Wayne, and you are listening to that show, The Cutting Edge. Excellent. Thank you very much, Adam. I appreciate okay. it. And so thanks, thanks a lot. Yeah, thanks for your time. I'm uh, sorry about the line. I can't. I can't sort of understand what happened. No, it's there. not your fault. No problem. <laughs> but say. All right. Take care. Thanks yeah, again. Congrats again, eh? And good. Good luck Thank with you. the rest of it. Thank you very much. Thank Bye. you. Bye now.